are incredibly fortunate. We want to welcome you uh, all to this event. Audrey Tang is here. Audrey Tang is Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation. Audrey is known for revitalizing the computer languages Perl, which we all use, and Haskell, as well as building the online spreadsheet system EtherCalc in collaboration with Dan Bricklin. In the public sector, Audrey served on Taiwan's National Development Council's Open Data Committee and the 12-year Basic Education Curriculum Committee and led the country's first e-rulemaking project. In the private sector, Audrey worked as a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics, with Oxford University Press on crowd lexicography, and with social text on social interaction design. In the social sector, Audrey actively contributes to GovZero, that's G0V, a vibrant community focusing on creating tools for the civil society with the oh, call to fork the government. I am so delighted and honored to be here tonight with Audrey Tank. Hello, good local time, everyone. Um, good local time from the future, just a few hours in the future, I guess. Um, so uh, how shall we proceed? Uh, I, I thought that we will begin immediately into the Q&A after the introduction. That's what I've heard uh, from my colleagues, if that's okay with you. That's fine with me. We're here. Uh, we're just delighted to have you. I wasn't sure whether or not you had a few words that you wanted to start off with. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have quite a resume or just mm -hmm. if you just wanted to like give us a big shout out about mm -hmm. uh, can you connect the first and the last that is, you know, you know, on the one hand, thinking about Pearl and then thinking about the mechanics of having worked on Pearl, how does that contribute to your ability to do work on GovZero? Like, is, do you think in the same way, but in a different context, or is it just totally a different, uh, a different set of skills? I would say it's the same skill. Uh, the motto of Pearl is, and I quote, there is more than one way to do it, unquote. Uh, and that means a focus on plurality. Indeed, I learned from Larry Wall, the creator of Pearl, uh, that he had a tweet that says, uh, everybody's talking about the singularities near. Uh, why don't we focus on the plurality, uh, which is here? Uh, and I think this is uh, so excellent so that I uh, turn it into literally my job description uh, as a digital minister around five years ago. And and my job description, I think, uh, if you want a few words to begin with, uh, I'll begin with my job description. And it goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. So it's all about listening at scale to the plurality. It's about um, using humor over rumor uh, in a way that's fast, fair, and fun so that we can overcome, say, the pandemic in Taiwan uh, with no lockdown and overcome the infodemic again with no takedown. So this is uh, fundamentally an idea about the government trusting citizens rather than asking citizens to trust the government. We must first trust the citizen, the plurality. Let me ask you a question. That's a fantastic introduction, uh, especially when I, uh, hearing heard by American ears in these times. So, what, when you th when you think about like uh, trust the, the, the that the, so here the question isn't even whether or not the government trusts us, but whether or not we trust the government. How do, do you believe that the philosophy still works? I mean, in some ways, who goes first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think the Dao De Jing, there's a saying from Lao Tzu that says to uh, give no trust is to get no trust. And so the fundamental point about trustworthiness it's not about a blind trust, like from one abstract organization to another abstract organization, but about this day-to-day -day feedback mechanism. For example, uh, and I uh, really only have one uh, slide to show, and this is the very cute Shiba Inu. Uh, the name is Zong Chai, uh, literally the spokes dog of our central epidemic, Monsanto. So every day uh, at 2 p.m. during the height of the pandemic here, um, everyone 
tunes in to this conversation between the minister Chen Shizhong and all the journalists who get to ask pretty much everything. Uh, and the thing about our CECC press conference is that it's all about asking the commander everything and anything. And anything that uh, we did wrong, that we didn't get right and so on, is guaranteed a 24 hour um, correction, a very fast iteration cycle. Uh, and always that, for example, uh, when a young boy back in April last year called the toll-free number 1922, even though he's not a journalist, uh, he said, um, you're rationing out mask, all I get is pink medical mask. Uh, all my boy uh, um, classmates uh, have navy blue ones, and I don't want to wear pink to school. Uh, the very next day on 2 p.m., uh, the commander and all the medical officer, regardless of gender, wore pink medical mask. Uh, it's an act of gender mainstreaming for sure, but uh, Minister Chen even said uh, publicly that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So the boy became the most hit boy in the class for only he had a color that the hero and the hero's hero wear, I guess, for some definition of wear. Uh, and so this uh, is trustworthiness. This is uh, the real time feedback mechanism that just um, in the last year alone, there's more than 2 million calls to 1922, all answered on an individual basis that makes sure that all the epidemiology um, experts can talk in a way that shows the trust to the citizens to make use of those signs well, and also explain it in a language that transcends um, disciplines and age groups. For example, our physical distancing rules uh, says that when you're indoor, keep three Shiba Inus away and outdoor, keep two of them away. And there's many gems like that. Why wear a mask uh, is there to protect you against your own unwashed hands so you wouldn't do what a dog is doing here. Again, this appeals to rational self-interest in a way of communication that is humble, that is definitely not top down or locked down or shut down. Well, we are suddenly opening up the floor to questions. I mean, otherwise, I can just keep going on. This is a fascinating conversation, especially talking about the pandemic, because the contrast to what we're experiencing here is so radically different. But I also want to bring it into the role of the pl of the of the platforms that we have here. So, like, how do you institute that? How do you institute that philosophy? into like social media or into a platform or is it solely to be applied on the relationship between the government and the people mm -hmm. yeah i think uh the current generation uh, of social media which i sometimes uh refer to as uh, anti-social media <laughs> um it doesn't quite do listening as skill that well. I mean, it, it does broadcasting or speaking as skill so that everybody uh, can, can speak, but not so much uh, listening across differences. Um, on the other hand, we take the motto, uh, don't hate the media, be the media, uh, very seriously. So we built our own pro-social media out of civic technologies, which in Taiwan is essentially the same as government technologies, because we work very closely with the free software slash open source communities. And so, uh, for example, one example, is that uh, we use this POLIS system, uh, originally innovated in Seattle, uh, but now it's open source as part of our digital public infrastructure. So at polis.gov.tw, everyone can uh, resonate or not uh, with any public statements that people make, for example, on the Uber case, which is the inaugural case that we use the police technology. And so this is very visual, so I guess I'll have to show a slide anyway. Uh, so this is uh, the Uber X conversation. Uh, and what you see here uh, in the blue circle represents the person uh, using the system. And the clusters are my friends and families who are all over the place that feels differently uh, about the Uber X case. Now, the thing is that instead of uh, jumping from facts to uh, ideas, uh, POLIS is designed to listen to people's feelings. And the um, interface design is in such a way that each citizen's feelings, like I feel that passenger insurance, very important, um, people would disagree or agree with it. And as they do, they move toward me or farther away from me, but there is no reply button. Without a reply button, there's no room for troll to grow. And people take um, mm. pride in proposing some nuanced ideas. 
that brings other people together rather than just focusing on you know the ideological uh, problems of for example is uber even a sharing economy is time sharing sharing uh, is it a gig economy is it platform economy which is of course very nice academically speaking <laughs> but it doesn't really get people's feeling together so people agree to disagree on the more pro-social mm -hmm. side of social media uh, they respect each other's ideological differences but doesn't spend calorie on it uh, and we get a rough consensus uh, meaning that people agree with each other's feelings most of the time actually on registration not undercutting existing meters on insurance and things like that and that's why uh, we legalized uber just in a few um, months after this uh, consultation and uber is now a local taxi in taiwan uh, but it elevates uh, the co-ops and existing taxi companies and fleets as well so that everybody wins or at least doesn't lose uh, in a setting of rough consensus now uh, so we say the binding power it's only on this sort of digital public infrastructure we do not use uh, say facebook or other parts of the digital realm uh, that are more like frankly speaking nightlife district nightclubs um, selling you alcoholic addictive drinks uh, private bouncers and all things like that we, we don't use that as town halls or public parks or public libraries uh, we use public digital infrastructure as digital infrastructure so so you saw you showed me that incredible uh graph of how uh, you know sort of a crowd agreeing mm -hmm. in general That's right. yes. you know there's this part of me that says but what is that person at the end the one guy that's hanging out over there but, but these are the thinking? statements it, it's not people i i and Oh, yeah. those are the statements? I'm sorry. These are the statements. So, so these are the more ideological statements that each one uh, divides the ah, people into halves, essentially. Uh, and if you look at the more anti-social corner of social media, that's what everybody focuses on. That's what drains people calories. But uh, what we are doing is essentially uh, letting people see a reflection of their own statements and sentiments. And they're, the more nuanced one that brings people together, like literally bringing people together, uh, shows that uh, there's actually much more in common. We share the same value, even though we start from different ideological positions. Academically, it's called overlapping consensus, but it's much more easy uh, if we show it in a way uh, with this neat visualization. So, so what about full expression? Like one of the things mm -hmm. when I think of parole as a language is mm -hmm. it's not just that it's many ways to represent something. Mm -hmm. It's also just uh, like one can exhibit a, a style in Pearl and mm -hmm. another person can have a totally different style. Mm -hmm. And to what extent, how much, how much flexibility do, can I get in the, in the presentations mm -hmm. of technologies you're describing? Yeah, uh, I think fundamentally, this is about who sets the agenda for public deliberation. Mm. And the design of our Polis platform, even though it's called polis.gov.tw, it means that all the citizens, uh, including the press, uh, who have used it to deliberate anything from the national ID uh, card strategy um, to like uh, random killing and whether, uh, you know, corporate punishment need to be abolished and whether that will encourage random killing, probably not, um, and things like that. And so um, the agenda setting is done by the social sector, by the people. Um, our national participation platform, uh, join.gov.tw, which is like uh, regulation.gov, I guess, because we publish our pre-announcements of regulations on it. But uh, very importantly, it connects a participatory budget interface so that people can comment and raise new ideas even after the regulation takes effect. And people can start new initiatives with 5,000 signatures. Uh, the ministry need to respond to it on a point-by-point -point basis. And so on the whole life cycle, if people yeah. have an idea, they can do a full expression on that particular idea and start a new police conversation without getting um, any approval uh, from the government. So this is not just GovTech. This is uh, what I refer to as what we call people-public-private partnership with the people side first, with the social sector setting the agenda. Okay, so this is fantastic. So I want to uh, offer, I want to, I want to understand more, and I'm going to do that by asking a kind of contrast point. So yes. if in the United States, if we have a new regulation that we want to, that our government is thinking about, they open up what they call a public comment server. 
and they invite people from the public to tell us what you think so people can respond. Um, and they can say anything they want. And then the government takes all of these comments, digests them, and provides a summary at, at the front end of whatever uh, the regulation. They'll try to answer the questions and so forth. But in the, the, if I've got this right, the model that you described would look different. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would be, instead of them saying, this is the new regulation we're mm -hmm. going to put it out, they may actually poll questions to understand better what kind of resentment they want to know that the public has. And and then as a member of the public, I could then respond to the particular qu questions in a kind of multiple choice manner or binary manner. And they would get that feedback without the discourse, right? Is that, is that, does that, is that, is that a fair comparison? Yeah. Um it is. Uh, I, I think uh, fundamentally, this is uh, a combination of two ideas that's previously not connected uh, in uh, policy making. One is that of a citizen's petition or a citizen's initiative. Uh, the U.S. also has We, we the People, uh, which is an online platform for this sort of petitions, uh, where you basically just collect, collect signatures uh, without much yes. substantial deliberation. And the second part is a wiki survey. But unlike survey that's done uh, by the uh, government by a fixed set of questions, this is survey that is crowdsourced. Each person can share their sentiment for other people to respond to so that the system basically surfaces the rough consensus uh, by a kind of friendly competition of who could raise the point that appeals to people with very different initial positions. Uh, it's a way to listen at scale without people having to do a top-down design of survey. And these two, independently mm -hmm. speaking, are done uh, in many parts of uh, local and national governments. The later part is done, for example, through open space technology technology through citizens assembly and things like that, while the first part is mostly just petitions and a list of names to hand to a counselor or to a legislator or to a minister. But we combine these two together and the social norm that shapes it uh, is much higher than each particular methodology. Indeed, the UberX conversation wasn't set or started by the government in 2015. The ministries are still figuring things out and it's the Gov0 or G0V community that decides to talk about UberX, to talk about Airbnb and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, so how do you, how do you, how do you give equality to the voices? So, you know, in the example I gave before, if I create a bot, I can distort public opinion because my bot gives me more voice than the person who has to type it in by hand. Mm -hmm. What, do, how do, how, can I go on Gov Zero? Uh, dot dtw mm -hmm. and distort the public opinion by mm -hmm. using my bot on on, on mm -hmm. there right if we look closely while uh, the clusters uh, which is by k-means clustering uh, algorithm um, yeah. measures the diversity and preserves the minority uh, ideas or opinions um, it doesn't uh, what it doesn't do is that it doesn't really uh, care about the same um, clusters population. So this 205 may be a small cluster, uh, but it's uh, not because it has 200 people in it. Actually, this one with just uh, less than 200 people it has a larger area because it measures more diversity. And so if people uh, get a bot in, uh, like 500 uh, fake accounts, which is difficult. Actually, they have to register 500 SIM cards, but suppose they do that, 500 SIM cards all voting the same way. Well, it may, may actually add a zero uh, to the population count here, but this area doesn't grow a bit. What each uh, statement must do is to convince people across the aisle, and we only hold as agenda the things that reaches this cross group um, kind of super majority uh, and this in-group coherence is just one factor out of it and spamming uh, that by voting doesn't really work. So what what does it what does it mean to be a voter on on Gov0? Is it that I would register with a particular party and therefore the diversity is a measure of the party or is it my gender, is it my race, is it my income? 
like what 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 cre like or do I register all of those things and the diversity measure is the sum of all these intersectionalities? And because this is a wiki survey, so uh, people could um, and they did. For example, when we deliberate about the Uber X case, uh, the initial demographical uh, questions are: uh, Do do you uh, do I, I, it's actually a personal feeling? So I I feel that um, even if a taxi uh, passes by me, I still reach for my phone and call Uber. So that's uh, one thing about personal feeling. And one is that uh, mm -hmm. I have a professional driver's license. I drive for a living. That's another thing. Uh, and another thing, yet another thing, uh, is that, for example, um, I um, uh, take taxis as part of my daily work. I'm a uh, commuter by taxi. That's, that's another one. Uh, and as you said, uh, there are also um, personal feelings uh, about economic preferences, about um, the places that I live, and I live in a metropolis or not. And people who care about diversity on any particular aspect, just add that to the wiki survey. So this is- But how did analysis. they do this? How did uh, they, they do they that? Just like... write, they just write, I am a taxi driver, enter. And, and then other people start responding to it. I see, I see, I see. So let me see if I got it right. I I want to do one of these, um, and let's say we were going to do it, you know, at Harvard on Harvard's campus, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so we would start with uh, the overarching question. People would come to the platform, mm -hmm. and that one overarching question though has multiple other statements that people mm -hmm. are asserting about themselves, and that's, that's right. how we. Be I see. Very That's clever. Right. It's very mm -hmm. clever. It's very clever. Um, I'm, we're, I just want to, you know, I'm so excited in, uh, talking to you. I may not be giving enough room here for people who have questions. So if, if you do have a question, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Oh, we do have a question here. Uh, and uh, Alice, can you, do you want to give your, ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, this is a fascinating conversation. Um, my question is regarding this year's theme of the conference, which is resilience and shared experiences. And I wonder if Minister Tang, you can share uh, some of the bias on how we can build resilience from within ourselves and among one another, perhaps drawing inspirations from your personal experience or from the unprecedented experience we have lived through in the past year. Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, personally speaking, uh, I think what I mean by trusting the citizens also means that we need to uh, be aware, be humble of the shortcomings of our own designs and also to explain in a way that invites co-creation rather than defending any particular uh, policy or personal decisions or things like that. The, the humility is the main thing that I learned uh, working in the counter-pandemic task force. Uh, one very quick example. Um, last February, February 6th, uh, we wrote out a very interesting uh, policy called uh, Real Name Mask Rationing and in which more than 6,000 pharmacies across Taiwan uh, participated and anyone can take their universal health card, it's an IC card, to the nearby pharmacy and get the allotted uh, masks at a very, very uh, cheap price. Now, uh, people don't want to queue in vain. So around that time, a civic hacker, the name is Howard Wu, uh, invented a way so that you can see which pharmacy uh, are out of mask and which pharmacies still have some, so you can go to a place that still have some masks. Um, it's entirely open API powered, so we published every 30 seconds the real-time numbers of availability so that people who prefer chatbots and so on can uh, access the same information in a way that's maximally inclusive, more than 100 different tools. But on the day that it launched, many pharmacies independently innovated and did what we call a take a number system. That is to say, instead of handing mask in return of swiping the IC card, they in the morning ask for the IC card and store it in the store and ask the customer to go back in the evening 
and take those number of badges and in exchange to the mask and the IC card while they process the IC card during the lunch break. Now, individually, these are two, both the map and the take a number system, very good innovation. But together, um, they just explode like Mentos and Coca-Cola. Uh, and, and that's because when you look at the map, you would see this pharmacy didn't sell anything until lunch. And then it sells everything. Uh, and so much so that a nearby pharmacy even uh, put a large banner that said, don't trust the app, exclamation mark. Now, I didn't sleep well that night, uh, but I did uh, go through the public comments and the 1922 feedback from the frontline pharmacists. And there's some real gems in it if I take away all the exclamation marks. Uh, and so the very next day, we apologized publicly. We didn't anticipate it. But because we're on an agile uh, timeline, a schedule, we say we'll fix it next Thursday by implementing this very good suggestion of on the map, we will show two time slots, one for collecting the number and one for collecting the mask. And that ameliorate a little bit of the problem. And later on, the pharmacist brainstormed and did uh, something clever, uh, which is just uh, disappearing from the map soon as those numbers run out mm -hmm. by entering, I received negative 5,000 masks. So they kind of hacked the system. And again, we didn't say that they're hacking the system. We said we need to institutionalize that. So we put a button that if they uh, click it, as soon as the numbers run out, they'll disappear from the map for the day. And so just by um, apologizing very swiftly, but always following it saying, uh, we will implement your workaround as a institutionalized response next Thursday. After three such iterations, there's not so much problem anymore. And to me, that's resilience. That is to trust your fellow citizen to come up with better design based on the one design that uh, may not be perfect, but there's a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. Um, I have to just ask you a quick question. Agile, how agile is it? Like, how fast did you get that system set up? Um, three days. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Well, look, we have lots of hands up. Let's uh, I think Valerie, you were up first. Yes, thank you very much, Minister, for being with us today. We're very excited. So I am curious, you know, being betting on technology from a government's perspective means a reallocation of power, you know, like who will who will own the data, who will be in charge of controlling certain platforms, new platforms. So what strategies have you used to persuade public leaders that might feel that they're losing some power due to the digital transformations? Thank you. And the strategy is to have an outside game. Uh, the main talking point is that it beats getting the parliament occupied by occupiers. Uh, because that's what happened in 2014. When people perceive uh, that there is no citizen control, uh, democratic control over, uh, at that time it was a trade deal, then people just occupied the parliament and took the matter to their own hands non-violently. Uh, I was there facilitating the live streaming, uh, more than 200 um, different topics were deliberated by more than 20 NGOs, half a million people on the street, many more online. And we did get a rough consensus, uh, 40 months, not one less, uh, that gets then ratified by the head of the parliament. But everybody agreed that this is very time consuming. And if we can uh, replicate some of those facilitated open space based technology using digital means that amortize this is actually less effort and less risk and also more trust as compared to get all the controversial uh, policies that ends up you know uh, getting the parliament occupied again so the um, short answer is that there has always be a outside game that threatens direct taking over by democratic and motivated people uh, if the government doesn't respond in time great thank you uh, leone Uh, thank you. Um, actually, my first question was already answered, so I'm going um, to ask a new one. Um, I am from from Germany, and what you're talking about, what has happened in, in Taiwan and how Taiwan has um, responded um, to the pandemic feels very far off um, to the reality that I'm experiencing. So one thing I was wondering, like all of these um, very advanced digital tools, um, what does it take that other countries um, also like adopt this model, uh, either tools or also just that model of uh, of engagement? Do you have any advice on that? Yes. 
Uh, I think there's two main requirements. Uh, one is a, as I mentioned, a public infrastructure view uh, on the digital. If the government essentially outsources public discourse to the likes of Facebook and Twitter, uh, there's probably no room for this kind of civic tech to make into the gov tech. So a commitment to broadband as human right, a commitment to digital competence, not just literacy in the basic ed education curriculum, all that is needed so that this digital public infrastructure includes people without excluding anyone. Indeed, anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second uh, both ways for just 16 euros per month, it's my fault, like personally my fault. Uh, and so that's the, the one requirement. The other requirement equally important is for for the career public service to be on board. If the career public service understand that this is the way to save them time, to increase the mutual trust, and most importantly, to reduce the risk of uh, zigzagging or flip-flopping um, on, you know, uh, the 49% of people feel that they have lost and suddenly increased by 2% and the public service have to redo everything again. Um, if they understand this social norm actually increases stability in them doing their public work, uh, then they will support it. And once the career public service takes the initiative, the politicians, uh, for them, there really is nothing to lose. How do you get away from power struggles within the within the career community within the career civil servant? Yeah, um, the power struggle is very real. It's always there. Uh, and my office, for example, maximizes diversity by inviting volunteer secondments from any ministry. But each ministry can only send one secondment at a time. So uh, all the 12 public facing ministries and councils have sent uh, secondments to my office, but they must work out loud, although they still report to their minister, uh, whatever they co-created become in the commons that all the different other ministries can learn from. And so this is deliberately designed in a way that's horizontal leadership. The vertical structures are always there, but within our office, the public digital innovation space, there's simply no room for that because each one offers a very fresh perspective. And it's all by a volunteer basis. So to date, uh, the Department of Defense never sent anyone to my office, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> uh, Jamie, you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's uh, really an honor to, to have you with us. Um, having shared under certain understanding of plural experience, I think is so important to, to building societal trust. Um, in your experience, what are some of the most effective ways that you've been able to build shared understanding? Yeah, I think really nothing uh, is more important than taking all the sides this is uh, my personal practice. Um, of course, I, I went personally through two puberties. <laughs> so uh, in my mind, I don't have this binary category, like half of the population is somehow more distant from me. Uh, to me, it's just a, a large homo sapiens community. Uh, and if I find that there's a particular viewpoint that I cannot say it in a way that I personally feel it uh, as important as genuine, I always think it's my problem, and I would then spend a few days uh, with that community, uh, learn a little bit of their culture and language and so on, on a ethnographic, or just hanging out <laughs> with people I, until I do. And so this uh, taking all the sides, the skill of uh, rotation is, I think, as important as the skill of listening or translation. Uh, Sachi? Hi, Minister Tai. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my question is, we live in a world of increasingly complex problems and there's a real strain on multilateral solutions working. And I was wondering, are you a global pessimist or an optimist? I can probably guess which one you are, um, but what, why do you think that? And do you have any advice for anyone um, erring on the pessimistic side? Yeah, I'm an optimist. It's a strange condition, I know, uh, <laughs> on the most pressing uh, global problems. And my optimism stemmed from the fact that uh, my first 
uh, political system uh, was the internet governance system that I joined when I was just 14 years old. But across the emails and the mail list and the working groups, nobody really cared or even know that I'm just 14 years old. Uh, and so I feel included uh, into the community. It wouldn't be another few years until even I get my first vote in the traditional low bid rate uh, representational political system. Uh, and so the internet governance is always based on the idea that it's uh, what we call the end-to-end -end principle. If you have a good innovation that solves uh, your own uh, problem and it, it scales in the sense that some other people maybe in another corner in the world also find it useful, um, they can fork it, meaning that take it into a different direction. And nobody between the two of you can say uh, whether this is a legit innovation or it's an innovation that should be banned. That was the original design spec uh, of the internet. So because of my experience in internet governance, which is open multi state stakeholderism, academically speaking, I do believe that the emerging issues that we are looking at at this moment is all caused by uh, the closer collaboration across stakeholder groups that previously need to go through intermediaries, but now work very closely together anyway. And the uh, uh, externalities, the social and environmental problems that stem out of this closed collaboration can only be tackled if we also apply the same closed collaboration across sector way uh, to work on it. So open multi-stakeholderism, I think, uh, is uh, something that feels very natural to me. And most of my work uh, in introducing this to the more pessimistic corners of this society is just to encourage them to make concrete contributions. It could just be uh, one type of thing fixed on Wikipedia. I just fixed a typo uh, a week ago on Wikipedia on the Equality Act, uh, the HR5, uh, the article, uh, or uh, one street in the open street map. Uh, and once they start contributing, they will start to feel that it doesn't really take this representative logic, which uh, many people feel that takes too long a time, but rather it could just be a re presentation of whatever they feel on the moment, and the contribution is reflected in the here and now. Minister Tang, you know, you were, you've been very gracious and you allowed me to call you from your first name. You're incredibly mm -hmm. humble and, mm -hmm. and, and very approachable. How do you, how does, how do you square the uh, authority that you have with, you know, with your, with your personality and your openness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, well, today's conference is uh, about women in power, right? but the, the kind of power uh, that I think uh, I hold is communication power, uh, a la Manuel Castells. Um, that is to say, we, we make networks and the power is entirely in the collective intelligence that's at the edges of those networks. So as someone that uh, make those networks connect to one another, the more authoritarian that I appear, the less bandwidth, actually, uh, the different networks that through me connects enjoy, like it, I become the bottleneck, so to speak. But by designing myself out, or design for resign, if that's a thing, <laughs> I, I make maximize the kind of communication that all those different networks, the civic tech network, social entrepreneur, impact investors, and so on, that can connect uh, naturally through those open spaces, those mechanisms uh, like the police system, the joint system, uh, sandboxes, presidential hackathons, and so on. Those mechanisms goes on, the space go on, but I don't hold uh, authoritarian power by myself. So you don't have to call me the right honorable or something. <laughs> well, we, 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 you hold that honor with us for sure. Uh, Maddie. Um, yeah, hey, um, thanks so much for this. Um, I'm wondering because we're students and we're all interested in politics and technology and just everything we've been talking about, what advice you have for um, aspiring public servants and students like us? Uh, to have fun, uh, to optimize for fun. That's my, my slogan in my Pro 6. Uh, days uh, and that still holds true. Uh, for uh, in my um, personal experience, um, the online anti-social social media, the divisiveness, the outrage, the hatred, the toxicity, uh, all of that is predicated on this uh, phenomena that outrage spreads faster than 
rationality. But humor, fun, spreads faster than outrage. Uh, and it's a one-way street. If one is outraged about something, but then think of a clever way to tackle some of the problem so the structural problem doesn't happen again or happen with uh, less likelihood. Uh, that's fun, that's co-creation. And once anyone feels this way, there's no going back to feel outrage uh, or hatred or uh, discrimination about the same topic anymore. But if uh, some people uh, start with a very divisive worldview, uh, you can't really convince them uh, based on rationality alone. And this time, a cute Shiba Inu, pink medical mask, rainbow mask, things like that, trending hashtags, these really helps. So optimize for fun is my main suggestion. That's fantastic advice. Um, I have a, a question for you. As the la last question came up, so many of the people at the conference are young students. So when you were seven, did you know that you would be Minister Tank? Or how, well, like what, what it, you know, many students feel that their lives are already predetermined. This is where I'm going to be when I'm this age and this age. But in reality, that doesn't usually happen. How about mm -hmm. for you? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm a slash. So I'm digitalminister.tw uh, slash uh, board member Radical Exchange, uh, working with Vitalik Buterin on Ethereum governance, uh, slash um, Digital Future Society Barcelona, uh, slash Council Democratic Foundation. Uh, that's a bunch of occupiers in Europe uh, and things like that. So um, I, I think it's uh, not about any particular post but rather about the connection between those posts, again, referring to the network and communication power. The more the slash become a, a dash <laughs> that connects things together, the more holistic uh, one's worldview become and the more practical this idea of taking all the side become uh, for me personally. So I would encourage, even if you think you have a predetermined uh, role or position to, to fill, it doesn't really um, exclude you to stop you from seeking other slash or dash uh, positions. And once those new positions uh, start to grow, um, you form your own new constellation. That's very nice. Uh, Sachi. Oh, sorry. I think that was uh, that was an old old question. <laughs> but that's okay. Oh. I I can ask another question. Um, you said before about creating a culture where government trusts citizens and citizens mm -hmm. trust governments. But how do you actually get there? What were some of the biggest hurdles that you had to overcome to get to this equilibrium, which seems really ideal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, government must trust its citizens. Uh, the other part is optional. <laughs> that citizen doesn't need to trust the government. Uh, I think the government should earn the trust and the citizens should trust us as much or as little as they want. Um, so uh, maximally trusting the citizens, I think, is easier if it doesn't take extra effort. Um, for example, the mask availability um, open API. Say if uh, we publish not 30 seconds at a time, but 30 days at a time with this monthly statistics uh, approval review process. That's actually what most governments do through a freedom of information um, access plan. But that basically says that the more publication one does, the more burden it places on the career public service. Contrast that with the open API, which simply says for things unrelated to privacy, national secrets, confidentiality, and trade secrets, and so on, uh, everything else, uh, we just publish whatever we collect and with all the um, quality problems that I just uh, highlighted a few questions back, right? And when people see that the quality is off, well, that's an uh, invitation to co creation. And the public service uh, only respond to the collective intelligence um, mandated uh, new ideas that's uh, provably better than the original ideas that we had. So we do not have to do this power struggle of keeping information to ourselves. What about the quality? What about the accuracy and things like that? We simply say, okay, this is what the machines tell us. It may or may not be right, but it's at no extra burden to the career public service. So automate it. This makes trust much easier to give from the government to its citizens. Uh, Jamie. It's me again. Um, you shared that you optimize for fun. Um, if mm -hmm. you had to give yourself advice when you were younger, what advice would you give? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, first of all, I would uh, start traveling across the world sooner, I guess. Um, I uh, did this poor or douche thing of randomly couch surfing and staying at people's homes until they get fed up with me and uh, suggest someone else for me to <laughs> crash. Um, and, and I did that when I was 25. Uh, in 2005, 2006. Um, but I actually could have done it sooner uh, if I learned to trust random strangers on the internet earlier. So that would be uh, my main suggestion to my younger self to trust random strangers on the internet. Maddie. Um, yeah, I <laughs> don't know if this is a question you can answer, but I wanted to ask as a student of US politics living in the US, we talk a lot about these issues of trust in government and citizen participation right now. And are there any politicians or parties you've wor looked, worked with in the US that you've enjoyed working with that you recommend we take a look at? Sure, uh, I'm slash uh, international advisor GovLab. So um, I work quite closely, actually, uh, with the Data Collaborative, with the Crowd Law, and many initiatives uh, of the GovLab in the NYU. So that's actually something that I can directly answer. Uh, Alice. Yes, I have another question related to women in power. I wonder, as a great leader like you, do you have any um, women role model? in this space, or do you draw any leadership philosophy, wisdom from any anyone or anywhere? Yeah, I, I signed up uh, to this particular post um, literally because I was quite touched uh, by our president Tsai Ing-wen in her first inauguration speech where she said, uh, before we think of democracy as a showdown between two opposing values, but from now on, democracy must become a conversation between a diverse set of values. I think that perfectly captures the new capacity that digital offers for us to listen, not just speak uh, at scale. And democracy, uh, in that view, uh, is a type of technology, is a type of social innovation that everyone can contribute to. It's not just something that's fixed in stone. Um, and so this democracy as a type of technology view, uh, I think I draw very heavily uh, from Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's uh, leadership and also from the fact that there's more than 14 years now in Taiwan for gender mainstreaming. So the uh, people public private partnership work um, is literally grew out of the feminist movement that then grew into this intersectional um, LGBTIQ friendly uh, movements. And there's just too many names uh, to name, uh, but Annette Liu, uh, our previous vice president, uh, she was also very influential. I have a... Uh, I I have a question. There's this incredible spirit about you that reminds me so much of what the internet was like many years ago, decades ago, before it became, before the United States became so commercial. And it seems like it's really shaped a lot of your thinking. Or which came first? Was it that the internet drew you because you were already like thinking, like of like, of, of like minds? Or is it, that it influenced you, that that early way of thinking about the internet it was a blank slate. What could this be? How could this work? And it was very open and very, uh, let's all do, we're all in this together kind of thinking, which you certainly have really taken to a whole new level. Yeah, I think the early internet definitely happened first because it was born in 81 and the internet was before that. So <laughs> there's a definite sequence of chronological events here. First, the internet, right? Uh, and I was born around the year uh, the personal computer uh, was introduced to the world and how I makes most of those personal computers anyway. Uh, so we do have a very strong ethos of just taking a new idea and then 
just make new forks to innovate, uh, to reverse engineer, if you will, uh, what uh, logic was there uh, in the designing of larger main, mainframe computers and things like that, but do it in a way that is democratized. And I don't mean democratization in the sense of becoming more accessible. I mean democratization in the original sense, in that citizen control, uh, the agenda of the development of the type of technology. So I think Taiwan's own democratization, the lifting of the martial law, as well as the early personal computer and internet definitely took place first. And I'm uh, in, uh, immersed in those communities and cultures so that it feels like native to me. Yeah, I you can definitely, uh, I can definitely see that and feel that. As, and in, in that way, it's a real pleasure. Um, what, so uh, back to COVID, so contact tracing, did you play a role in contact tracing? Mm -hmm. And if so, what does that look like in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm a mostly a poetician, so I mostly just write poems uh, and, and recite them. Uh, and so the day-to-day -day operations, I'm only involved in the mass distribution and not in particular the contact tracing. But uh, one heuristic that I helped to define is very important in that we only collect data during the pandemic from the touch points that we were already collecting anyway before the pandemic. We do not invent new data collection touch points. And this is out of this respect to privacy and cybersecurity, because for unknown systems, uh, greenfield systems, the cybersecurity and the privacy parameters are unknown, literally to the people coding them probably. Uh, and so there is very, um, much a difficulty in forming a social consensus uh, where lies the acceptable uh, realm. But because we only use existing data collection points for, for example, location-based earthquake warning, flood evacuation warning, uh, the National Health IC card, uh, and things like that, people understand very well the regulatory and the algorithmic uh, parameters of safety. And so people feel safer because we don't have to declare, uh, and we never did, a state of emergency uh, that makes the administration grow and the legislation shrink. Everything that we do must be interpolated and approved, pre-approved by the legislature. So what are, what are you working on next? What's new on the horizon that you can share with us? Mm -hmm. And we just published um, a month ago uh, the National Action Plan on Open Government in Taiwan. So instead of just uh, one anecdote here or one anecdote there, uh, this is now a system of 19 commitments to the global open government partnership community that we will institutionalize the kind of co-creation as evidenced by the examples that I uh, just presented uh, in day-to-day -day government work. In particular, I'm excited about this dimension of opening up citizen control to people uh, below 18 years old. This is mm -hmm. first because I'm very active as a 14 years old, but I also genuinely believe that the youngest people, they have least legacy system view. They don't uh, mm -hmm. get trapped in the business as usual uh, thought. And judged by the more than one quarter now, uh, e-petitions that they raise on the joint platform, they care the most about sustainability uh, and uh, regenerative potential of the economy, long-term thinking and things like that, which I firmly believe is the direction to go. Okay. Um, Valeria. Thank you. No, I just wanted to, to thank you so much, uh, Minister. I know that you have to run for your for your next uh, meeting. So I just wanted oh, to like mm -hmm. thank you and maybe, um, yeah, thank you on behalf of everyone, like this group of fans that you have over here. Mm -hmm. Professor Latanya, back to you. Professor yeah, my next meeting is the cabinet meeting, so I bet you not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been gracious. We really appreciate it. What a great honor. Thank you very much, Minister Tang. And thank you for the great questions and exchange of idea. Uh, until we meet face to face, uh, live long and prosper, everyone. Oh, oh, I can't do it, but thank you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> live long and prosper. Bye bye. Bye.